Might as well rock and roll. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for, for being here and coming to Physics Friday, uh, the spiritual physics research discussion. This is the fourth of five discussions on spiritual physics. And today I understand that we are going to be talking about quantum mechanics for certain. Um, this, the format for tonight will be again, that I will speak briefly, hopefully for no more than five minutes, that's my goal. And then Doug will present, Doug Sweetser will present um, the bulk of the topic for the evening for about 30, 35 minutes. And then we'll have a general time for questions, answers, discussion, that kind of thing. So tonight we are talking about quantum mechanics and we're also talking a little bit more in a little bit more of a straightforward manner, I suppose, about God or theology or what would God be if somebody said they believed in God um, and how those things might relate to one another. I think I, I've told you before, I know in sermons, for those of you who have heard any of my sermons, that I am personally a panentheist as opposed to a pantheist. A pantheist believes that God is synonymous with the universe, with everything that is. A panentheist, adding an extra en, is, a, you know, the encyclopedia definition for panentheism is the belief that God or the divine pervades and interpenetrates every part of the universe and also extends beyond space and time or space time. The way I personally talk about panentheism is a belief that the divine is within all things in the universe and, and within all the laws of the universe that we come to understand and also something beyond anything that we understand about the universe. I generally personally don't use the word God because it tends to set, uh, suggest an anthropomorphized sort of being that I don't uh, tend to believe in myself. So I think of it more as ultimate reality or the great mystery of the universe. And, but of course, words never do any of this justice, which in a way for me is part of the relationship between theology and the topic of quantum mechanics in that no one really understands what they're talking about. You know, you kind of have your concepts and maybe you can articulate part of it, but there's some part of it that just is kind of beyond anything you can, you can really wrap your mind around and put into words. The other thing I think about when I think about quantum mechanics and theology is the, the idea of process theology. And I don't know if you are familiar with process theology, but the idea came up by some theologians, sort of modern theologians that, you know, most people, when they think of God in that classical sense, they think of God as eternal and all powerful and all knowing and so on. And if you believe literally in that kind of a God, it's hard to also have free will for humans. So you almost have to think that God already knows exactly what's gonna happen, so how could you really have free will? Well, process theologians held on to a fairly traditional concept of God, but said, okay, but humans still have power, they still have free will, and they still have the ability to sort of change what happens next. And so it was sort of like, God needs you to do the right thing to bring about um, a beautiful world. It makes me think of something Jesus is supposed to have said in the, in the Gospel of Thomas, which is my favorite version of it. Uh, Jesus is in conversation with his disciples and they ask him when the realm of God would come and Jesus says, it won't come by watching for it. It will not be said, look here or look there. Rather, the Father's kingdom is spread out upon the earth and people do not see it. 
So when I think of this kind of idea, it, it almost makes it sound like Jesus was a process theologian, although he would not have used that term. <laughs> he would not have known or used that term. But it's almost like, you know, God is this incredibly powerful entity, but God still needs you. Uh, God still needs us to do the right thing. And yet the kingdom or the realm of God is already here. So it, that reminds me of the Schrodinger's cat that we'll talk about in a while. Like God's kingdom is here and isn't here. <laughs> and it's kind of a matter of probability on some level. And how's it going to break? And how's that, how are we going to make that happen? Uh, so those are some of the types of theological pro- thoughts that come into my head when I think about this topic. Um, personally, for me, the big question always comes back to free will. And that's even if I get back to my less anthropomorphized version of the divine. And I think, okay, panentheism. God is everything we know about the universe and the laws of the universe and something else beyond. That's my divine. Well, again, a lot of theories of time or space-time tend to suggest that you can take slices of space-time and look at things that happened in, the, in our past or in our future. And you kind of come back to that Schrodinger's cat place of, well, can there really be free will if there is already a slice of space-time that includes things that happen in the future? So even when I think about theology, it starts to feel like quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So that's where my mind kind of went with this in terms of how I think about the topic spiritually. So just a quick introduction of Doug Sweetser, if any of you don't know. Doug is a member of the church I serve. I don't think I said my name. That was foolish. I'm I'm getting too used to this. Did I say? I don't think I did. My name is Laura Hoke. I'm the minister of First Church Unitarian in Littleton. And Doug is a parishioner of mine. And uh, along with his wife and and his daughter, they all come to our church. We're very happy about that. Doug graduated from MIT, class of 1984, with degrees in biology and chemical engineering. And he has also a master's in software engineering from Brandeis. So he is wicked smart. He's a software release engineer. But just for fun, in his free time, he does unfunded research uh, in the numbers, as he says, in the numbers that nature may be using for their magic. So with that, I will turn it over to Doug. Already from the title, you know I'm not going to give you the usual story about quantum mechanics. uh, Because... For me, I see things as just puzzle pieces missing. And if pieces are missing, it's going to be not possible to solve the puzzle. So we'll see if I can explain uh, that unusual and unconventional perspective. So the outline for tonight's talk is that we will review the progress that we've made. And believe me, I'm really quite impressed with you guys uh, sticking through it as far as you have. We really have touched on the kinds of things that people don't try to bring a general audience to. And we, yes, we are going to talk about God. Why are we going to do that? Well, because I think it's related to the mystery of the mystery of quantum mechanics. We'll take a good close look at this T-shirt, and then we're going to have not one, but two Schrodinger's cats videos. And uh, I should say, you seem to have a lot of S's there. With cats, plural? Yeah, actually, that's part of the trick of understanding this story is it is not one cat. There are more cats than that. All right. So this these are the five most important equations in physics. This was the topic of our uh, first get together. And uh, we are able to put it all on one graph and we were only using zeros and ones. And yet, at least to to this audience, I claim that those mean an awful lot. Uh, The most important one is the zeros because that's what the observer does. They stay right at the center stage. Um, And that person can remember their, their past and the past is a positive one, zero, zero, zero which is unconventional. People usually think of the past as being a negative number for time, but then it would change things. And that's the thing about the past. It can't change anything. 
And every time I've multiplied something by one, zero, 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 I haven't changed the number at all. <laughs> and that's kind of at the heart of the argument. And uh, I also argued that the zero, one thing, that when you square it, you end up with minus one, zero, zero, zero. And what that means is the future is a negative number. It's a future here, here future. So we started to uh, show that you could go around different places on this sort of chart by multiplying by one of these zero, one, one of these imaginary numbers. And then we said, hey, space is actually three dimensional. So you really need to try and think about spheres. And then I said, to describe things really, you need both me space, space time, where you get to say where stuff is. And you also need this you are space, this energy momentum space to describe other people or other structures, what kind of properties they have. And if you put all this together, to me, it almost feels like too much, <laughs> okay? And that's okay because unfortunately that's the way nature seems to work is yes, you've got numbers and you've got three dimensional space and you have to think about me space and you space and know that somehow nature knows how to do all of these all the time, never makes a mistake. So that's kind of remarkable. In the uh, last talk, I talked about uh, angular momentum, calling it instead returning momentum, energy. And I tacked on the energy because I think that's a more complete story. But even better than that, if you think about having a lot of spinning tops, well, the spinning has a, has, has a pointy quality to it. But if you have too many, that, that will kind of cancel out and leave you only with returning momentum energy being non-zero. And that might be a new path to understanding inertia. And the remarkable thing about that is we really haven't made too much progress on inertia since Newton defined it himself <laughs> in his first law. So uh, that was really, uh, I, I really am I'm glad that uh, I, I came up with that. That was a lot of fun. Okay, so then we went on to comparing speedy relativity that uses the velocities that you, you know, use to describe cars and gravity relativity. That's a new idea of mine that uses escape velocities. And the best thing about this is that you've got these hyperboles that are standard fare for special relativity, the zippy U guy. And if you just rotate that by 45 degrees, that's my, at the core of my proposal is those hyperboles might be involved with gravity. You will agree about those curves, whether you're using special relativity, normal velocities, or these uh, angled uh, hyperboles when you compare escape velocities. And now th that's, that's our review, okay? So that's what we covered um, in the first three kinds of lectures. Numbers, the special relativity, and my proposal for gravity. So now we're gonna shift to God. Uh, and I've been reading this book by Kendi about uh, the anti-racism, and he always started with a definition. So we have quite a few definitions of God we could choose from. There is a polytheist sort of definition. And to be honest, I, I'm not so good at showing that kind of approach a deep respect because I get raised in a culture where you're like, well, those were primitive people who didn't understand nature. And so they assigned a God to do different types of tasks and Yet I think we should show such people a profound respect because in a lot of ways they understand nature better because they really lived it with all their lives. Here, I've got all this knowledge about how Zoom works <laughs> or doesn't work and uh, all these 
various computer languages that are already dead. And, uh, and I can't tell whether, you know, Mercury is in retrograde by going out uh, in the early evening and seeing where it is. So um, we really need to show more respect uh, for native peoples. Then there's the Old Testament kind of God who I, I consider a, a rather harsh uh, male uh, person. Um, <laughs> you really didn't want to cross that guy. Um, versus the New Testament God who is supposed to be very loving as long as you said he was the ultimate God. Uh, there's the Quran, which uh, has been marketed of late, uh, you know, in the 2000s as like the source of all evil and it definitely is not anything of the source, uh, sort. Um, you know, there is that one God, that one God that is all, and it's actually too much, uh, which kind of ties in a, a little bit uh, with what Laura was saying, which was kind of interesting. Then there is the uh, trip, Chipitaka, uh, which is like uh, an early Indian book uh, where, you know, it's not very much about God per se. It's more the goal is enlightenment. What do you have to do in the now to, to become enlightened? And that's a very different perspective from, you know, who's the top dog, who's, uh, who's the ultimate power um, that often is associated with the word God. But that's not the only book. There is the Book of Mormon and uh, you know, they have Jesus in the United States after the resurrection, apparently. Um, that's a newer book, definitely, uh, built off of uh, golden um, uh, tablets found in uh, somewhere in New York. So, um, and then there's the Book of Shadows, which is uh, part of uh, Pagan Coven's um, and there are a whole bunch of books associated with, with that sort of way of trying to find uh, a deep meaning uh, to what, what all is going on. So and this is my own personal definition. Uh, God is every event that ever was anywhere and every event that ever will be anywhere when and the only door between the past and the future is through you and me. And one consequence of that particular definition is that physics study is actually uh, related um, to that kind of definition of God. So I, this is the, a Unitarian Universalist uh, function. Uh, and, uh, and with that definition of God, I actually embrace the diversity of perspectives. Uh, I'm not going to put down anybody who comes around and says, you know, Jesus is our Lord. You really need to devote your life, life to that particular person or a Buddhist who's working on enlightenment um, or somebody who, were, who takes the Koran very seriously, so seriously, you know, they pray five, seven times a day. Uh, I, I have a harder time with the Mormons. <laughs> That's why I kind of didn't uh, uh, make the, their more Book of Mormon larger in, in this slide. I, I, I thought that would be more honest. I mean, uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Smith kind of made it up in New York uh, back in the day, uh, to be honest. Uh, but uh, such people, um, they, they are entitled to their views. And uh, then this was uh, part of a pagan book. I don't quite remember which one it was. So now we go over to quantum mechanics. And what definition do you want to use there? It turns out that you do have choices. Uh, this was taken from a wiki page. There are 13 listed here. The Copenhagen interpretation is the most famous. Um, then there is the many worlds sort of thing. Uh, there's the parallel worlds. There is uh, the pilot wave. And, you know, the more you dive into the subject, the more that you can see the uh, variations that are there. And this chart is actually kind of useful in the sense of it's, it says what kind of general concepts one approach might have versus another. 
And so if you think one of these concepts is particularly important, you'll take the one that's got the green box. And if you actually think that that concept is wrong, you'll take the red box. So in theory, just not perhaps in practice, you could then say, I guess the, uh, the uh, approach to quantum mechanics I like the best is this one. Uh, but then of course, you always have to confront uh, Richard Feynman's uh, quote here, um, which was, uh, uh, I think we can, um, let me just do something here. Um, I think I can safely say that no one understands quantum mechanics. And, you know, that was st stated, I don't know, 50s or 60s. Uh, and of course, he was really, really good at physics. <laughs> okay, um, great. Um, okay, so Einstein was always impressed with quantum mechanics the success it had in predicting things, uh, but not so much with the ontology, uh, fancy way of saying, why did it work? So quantum theory yields much, but it hardly brings us close to what the old man's secrets. I, in any case, am convinced he does not play dice with the universe. And that was a letter to Born. And of course, these letters were shared and uh, Bohr got back to him and said, you know, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> and they had a rich, long, very respectable relationship that where they did not agree in the end. Um, and I think, you know, this is projecting, uh, but I can't imagine Einstein would be happy with any of those 13 uh, that we've come up with so far. Um, and in a certain sense, what I wanna say is I don't embrace the diversity of quantum mechanics interpretations. Um, Einstein didn't come up with a bunch of trivial objections. He actually pushed the people who developed quantum mechanics to think through their thoughts with much greater care. Uh, he challenged them. <laughs> he gave them problems that were actually hard. And they actually did answer the questions eventually. But they weren't easy. And even later in his life, he found other objections, like, are you trying to say that quantum mechanics has to be non-local? And that actually was not resolved until, well, it depends on who you talk to, but like not, the first experiments about that only showed up in the 1980s. And quantum mechanics, the math logic of it uh, still reigns supreme, but it was pretty impressive that a question he brought up as a theoretical objection in the 30s took 30 years to get the theory and another 20 years to get the results that said, yeah, he, Einstein wasn't right, <laughs> but he had a subtle and important complaint about uh, quantum mechanics. So I think we need new ideas. And without those new ideas, we're going to stay in the same cycle. So one of those new ideas is to use these space-time numbers as merely an upgrade to complex numbers. So you might say, well, I don't know what a complex number is. Okay, well then let me just say that all calculations in quantum mechanics as done today by the professionals only use complex numbers. And complex numbers have two parts. One's called a real part and the other is called the imaginary part. And they behave mathematically in a very, very precise way. And you say, and what do they mean physically? And physicists kind of don't care. <laughs> it's successful. Success is great. And that's good enough. And to me, that's where the disconnect is. That you really need something where you go, this is how it maps directly to this ordinary room I'm in. 
So with space-time numbers, you have four parts. You have three for space and one for time. So if you snap your fingers to describe that finger snapping, we would have had to give a location to that space with three numbers and a time. And it's nothing more complicated than that. So I've actually given a talk um, on this subject. Um, and it was received essentially like most of my other talks, which is not particularly well. Um, because to be very honest, I am a flawed spokesman. Uh, I don't have any institutional backing. You know, I come from my basement here. <laughs> Actually, I think I usually say from quaternions.com. And that's not a, a major university. And everyone knows it immediately. Um, and physicists, when they talk to me, they also know I'm not a physicist because you can't train yourself to the PhD level that physicists are all trained at. And, and my uh, training is spotty at best. And uh, when I gave a talk at this uh, local APS meeting, there were like eight old guys in a Zoom room. And uh, this session went on for 30 minutes. Everybody had a block of 10 minutes. And there was no discussion. And then that was it. I was like about as flat <laughs> a presentation as you can imagine. But, so I've enjoyed the view of views I've seen and I will continue to work. Uh, but I'm also trying to get myself in a position where I just say, you know, I think all these, these ideas will just have to be repackaged and rediscovered by somebody else some, some other day and just be happy with that. And I think I am. Oh, of course, if I'm wrong, I mean, who cares what I thought? <laughs> okay, so what, what's all the success about? You know, I mean, quantum mechanics with complex numbers is darn successful. So I think what's going on there is that the, it is about space time, but you can take space and lump it all together. That is, of course, not what professionals think. They just say, it's a tool, it works, don't question us. <laughs> so real numbers are different from imaginaries. And yet they're usually graphed on a square piece of paper where the real number and the imaginary number are no different. And that, in my opinion, is a problem because then you're justified in saying, I don't see the difference because there isn't one. Whereas if you say the real number is time and the imaginary is space, then they are different. To reverse in time, you have to remember, oh yeah, that happened and now I'm reversing it. To reverse in space, one needs a mirror. And if you think of complex numbers that way, then you say, well, I might as well make the space part, the part that needs a mirror, be 3D and not just 1D. So um, we will see if over time uh, we can get any professionals interested in that as a concept. So my missing idea number one is that we have to go from 2D complex numbers to 4D space-time numbers because we live in a 4D universe, one that's got three spatial dimensions and one for time. Okay, so now I'm gonna discuss this t-shirt that yes, I am wearing. Um, so we're gonna, look at it in kind of more general ways and kind of before we dive into the more of the specifics. And so let's just look at color. We've got uh, some dark and light yellows. We've got a turquoise going on and we've got this dark purple. Good. And let's look at patterns and we see one pattern here. It's, oh, it's all, uh, all yellow and turquoise. And the other one, well, it's not actually all purple. 
it's nearly all purple, <laughs> okay? But you might notice if you squint closely that it's got a thin line of yellow and it's got a thin line of turquoise right around the axes. And then if we look at the bottom two uh, images, you say, hey, one of them's half yellow and half purple. And the other one is half purple and half that turquoise. And if you're really sharp, you really squint hard, you'll notice that, that that purple one, it actually shows up a little line of yellow up on the top side. So, um, okay, well, why do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me give you the labels that I put for these graphs. So the one that's all yellow uh, and turquoise is all of God's physics. So whether we understand it or we don't understand it, what I'm saying is it happens in three-dimensional space and time. And actually, part of the reason that I did this is because professionals are espousing a possibility that we have more than three dimensions of space. And if you push them on how many more, they'll say, well, historically, we went to four dimensions. And then we went to, uh, let's see, nine more dimensions, then we went to 10 dimensions, and sometimes we go to 25 dimensions of space. Uh, they've explored all of those things. And all those possibilities make predictions that kind of don't uh, that, that definitely have not been confirmed by any experiment. And um, yeah, and the other possibility is this parallel universes where there, there are multiple branching different possibilities. And I just think a space-time diagram as it is, how, as I've explained to you so far in this series, is probably more than enough <laughs> to handle this confusing and amazing uh, world that we live in. Okay, so the next one over, the one that's mostly purple, that's Newton's classical physics. And there he gets to keep only the information that's very, very close to the either axes. Um, actually, let me get this drink of water here. <clears throat> Okay, so this is mildly ironic in the sense that Newton himself thought he was so good that he was pretty close to the mind of God. <laughs> I, I don't know exactly how he phrased that, but he was not known as a, a modest uh, fellow. And it's ironic because we eliminate most of uh, the, this, uh, this space time with the purple, purple boxes. You can't go down, you can't get down because time and space have to have a relationship to each other. And his system, he even knew, couldn't have one rotate into the other. They had to be completely uh, logically separate. And that's not the way it is. Why not? Because of Einstein's contribution. And I'm showing just these yellow boxes where one is supposed to be the past and the other is supposed to be the future uh, to say that whatever happens here now has to have been caused by the events in the past light cone. Those are the only ones. And that's why we're blocking out, as it were, uh, with that purple, um, those outside space cones, uh, space, space diagrams. And I should say that physicists just don't draw these diagrams. It's not that if you explain, oh, what part of region, if, if you ask a physicist, could you tell me what part of a Minkowski space-time diagram does Newton use? They would say, oh, right around the X axis. They just wouldn't draw you a picture. But I think you can see the power of a picture. Because once I had that picture for causality for relativistic physics, I said, well, shouldn't there be something where you use the other half? <laughs> We've got the picture of God's physics. It's got the yellow and it's got the turquoise. And that led to this 
I, it was really a joyous discovery for me to say, hey, maybe this other great early uh, 20th century discovery was putting that information to practical use in calculations. And the thing is that all that information that's outside that light cone can't tell you a darn thing about here now. It's too far away, but it can be put to use. It can say, what are the odds of a very particular kind of interaction happening? And that's what quantum mechanics does. It tells you about the future. Okay, so the missing idea too is to use space-time regions of space-time for quantum mechanics. Great. So um, now we're going to talk about that darn cat of Schrodinger. This is a please stop the video moment because I haven't secured the rights to Minute Physics uh, video from 2011 on Schrodinger's cat. And it is well worth the two minutes to watch it. So I hope you go do that search and return soon. Of course, th 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 this is the uh, brilliant, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. I should know his name. Um, th this is Minute Physics and they usually aren't a minute because he's di diving into pretty deep uh, concepts. I think this was like a minute, 50 seconds or something. Uh, he's got that, uh, that bass going, strumming away. And he's got his own style, his own vibe. I love this man. I love the contribution he's made to reaching out to people. And I don't know that I've ever seen a video that I said, ah, oh, that was a waste of time. They, they, this is a guy to, to uh, find out about if you don't already. And, um, and I think he's just brilliant. Okay, so that inspired me. I said, well, I got a reply. This was done Sorry, this was done in 2011. And here we are 10 years later. He's asking for an answer. <laughs> and so I just said, well, I, I got to try and make one of these myself. And, uh, and I rushed, it was a rush job, but um, we're going to give it a go. So it's, uh, here we go. I like to talk about observers and uh, be very clear about what I'm talking about. They can be either tiny or huge. So tiny would be like an electron, which is a point particle. Can't get much tinier than that. We've got the positive number past and the negative number future. Or you could go like really big, galaxies, because they observe their local galactic clusters and all that kind of stuff. And you can do math on that. Now, both of these have a here now. Uh, now being the first number, here being the, the other three. And we know the math. Zero plus zero equals zero. Zero times zero is zero. And that means that every observer is stuck at here now. And I call this my inverse Mach principle. I think observers are the key. All right, so complex numbers used all the time in quantum mechanics. It's got a real imaginary, but what does it physically mean? Well, with space-time numbers, which is a slight generalization, aka quaternions, uh, I know what that means. Time, there's one of them, and it's a real number. And there are three space terms. Now, it's well known that Einstein had all kinds of issues with quantum mechanics, so we're going to make him the observer and give him a little magnifying glass here. Uh, he's in a light cone, which is actually very comfortable in because light cones have to do with causality. We've got the past there as a positive number. We've got here now. Um, and we've got the future, uh, which is a negative number, at least according to me. <laughs> We're going to give him a nice big uh, plane to do his experiments. And over here, he digs a trench, does the whole trench thing. And we'll just say that's at zero, one, zero, zero. Zero, that first one means it's now at location one. And uh, now we put another trench in at a different location, zero, zero, one, zero. We got an orange tabby cat. We got a red cat. 
Uh, but these are going to be part of our experiment, so we have to put them in the trenches. So the red cat goes in that one, and the orange one goes over here. Cool. Oh, yeah. I got to put in <laughs> the, 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 the explosives. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. It's the way it goes. Uh, so we're going to count down um, or count up. Let's see. And uh, one, two, three. Oh, 60. I counted really quickly. Now this is Einstein. We send photons as quickly as we can. Green ones for living, red ones for dead. Oh, that was green. Good. And both lived. That is cool. So if we square this uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, we get minus 1. Einstein gets it in the future one minute, uh, one unit later. Okay, so we're going to repeat the experiment. So we have to uh, redo jigger things. And I thought, I don't know, let's really change this up a little bit. Let's just move this um, second trench out a bit further. So Einstein's going to get this information later because it's located in a different place, which you can kind of do with the uh, space-time numbers in a way that makes sense. Oh, look, I re just repeated it. Green lived. Oh, oh red died. Um, I'm sorry to report that, but it's an experiment. So there's the RIP. And so there's this notation they uh, use in professional circles. It's called bracket notation. And we just know that you do this enough times, it comes out to a half. Um, so after Einstein knew one of them was red, lived, um, it would be that and the bracket notation. And then once we knew both pieces of information, well, we knew both pieces of information. So it's not a big deal. Um, and what I like to say is that's two state dimensions uh, versus four space-time dimensions. That's Schrodinger's cat. All right, cool. And that's our talk. Okay, so we'll end with the uh, the usual uh, slide with uh, the sheet uh, t-shirt front and back, and we can open up the floor uh, for more conversation as soon as I figure out how to uh, close it. Oh, there we go. Nice job with the video, Doug. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Oh, it was. It was. It was just joy that it turned out that well. I literally own this white cube that you're that you're supposed to draw in. I because yeah. I remember him explaining that's how you do it, and then not using it for probably a decade. So uh, it was it was really fun to do. Yeah, it Quick, came out very well. It did. It was great. Quick word of defense for the Book of Mormon, which is just that. Uh, okay. Well, it's it's supposed to be divine revelation, but a lot of scripture is divine revelation. So you have to believe that God sort of spoke directly to the person who wrote it down. And and those are the divinely revealed scriptures. And the Book of Mormon just happened to be written more recently, which somehow somehow when you add time to it, it, it gives some sort of legitimacy or a gravitas or something. But truly, it's kind of, in some ways, uh, divinely revealed scriptures are, you know, you either believe it or you don't, literally yeah. or metaphorically or what have you. Yes, and and you you and I certainly accept that that people do believe that's the div divine. Um, but then I heard somebody say that uh, somebody who was into marketing say, "Oh no, this this is cla classic uh, the 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 structure of the religions." that the oldest one doesn't care, that the newer ones care about getting converts, and that the, the newest of the new ones are the most aggressive about getting new people. Right. And, uh, there's, and there's definitely some truth to that. Like the two oldest religions, Hinduism and Judaism, are, do not have the version of, of the tradition of trying to get converts. But I don't want to take over your discussion. I just no. wanted to throw out the defense of the Book of Mormon. And I, I know so many wonderful uh, members of that Church of Latter-day Saints. I just wanted to throw that out there. 